welcome back. This week I'll be making a 16th century shift and a French hood to go with the kirtle that I made last week and to go with the gown that I intend to make next. Right. And the shift is a pretty simple pattern, so if you're interested in making it, you can absolutely do it with a few simple materials. Let's go ahead and get into the making of a Tudor shift and a French hood. I based the shift pattern on instructions from a Pinterest post and modified it a little bit based on what I had to change. The original pattern calls for the front and the back body panels to be exactly the same size, but I wanted it to come up as high as my kirtle in the back, so I had to make the back bigger. I did it after the fact with piecing. For the front panel, the width will be half of your bust measurement plus two inches of seam allowance. The length will be from where you want the neckline to hit down to about your knee. You can also bring the neckline up higher or bring the hem down lower. Just just add an additional two inches of seam allowance to that measurement. For the back panel, measure from whatever point you want it to hit on your back to the same point on your knee or your leg. Then cut out four gores. Those will be 10 inches wide at the bottom and the length will be the same as on your front body panel. There are two five by five gores and there are two wrist cuffs that are five inches wide and as long as the circumference of your wrist plus one inch seam allowance. For the sleeves, measure from the tip of your shoulder to your wrist and add an inch of seam allowance. The width will be the measurement from wherever you want your neckline to hit to about where your bra would be in the back and then you'll cut out two of those arm pieces. Then it was time to get absolutely decked by spatial reasoning. I am attempting to assemble all of the pieces. The triangular gores I've sewn together and placed inside of the two body pieces and I'm currently trying to figure out how to set the sleeve. Sleeves are always tough but this is especially tough, and somehow it's just gone heinously wrong. I don't know how it's gone this wrong. Future Kate, however, has an idea of how things did go so wrong. In retrospect, I think I probably should have sewn the gores to each side of the front and back panel separately, then attach the arms using the gussets so that the gussets are then sewn to each half of the gores and they meet in the middle just below the gusset. So I only would have had to deal with inserting the gores into the gussets instead of having to finagle the gores, the gussets, and the front and back body panel. Pushed in an extra panel to the back because this version was really low in front and in back and I wanted it to come up close to my neckline and back and then have it be low enough to kind of sit at the level of the kirtle bodice. But now I'm trying to figure out how the gores, the gussets, the sleeves, and the two body panels all go together. And so far the answer has been that they don't go together. I have mentioned in the other videos the way gussets work is they go into your armpit and they're a diamond pattern, so the side of the body is on one side, the other side of the body is there, and then the two sides of the sleeves will go onto there. And I just have to remember which parts of the sleeves those are. With my mistakes unwittingly set in stone, I decided to sew everything together while watching a YouTube video about a church that was built solely based on funds earned from selling indulgences that allowed people to eat butter during Lent. Suddenly I understand why Henry VIII wanted to make his own church so bad. The butter money. Indulgences, baby! Butter does not bring a premium in today's Maybe it does though. Why? If everyone's doing keto, and you, have to, and you have to get an indulgence to do keto during Lent. I was able to sew the gusset to the sleeve with relative ease, but getting the gusset and the gores to come together was much more difficult because of the way I constructed it. I sewed from the top of the garment down along the connection between the gusset and the gores. I struggled to arrange the gussets and gores in a way where everything would fit neatly together. In the end, a small section of the gores overlapped at the top and I had to cut it off. Then Morgan Donner's hair taping tutorial came out just in time for me to frolic. The pattern for this, but it did not come with instructions, so I'm trying to figure it out based on the prior shift that I made. It's a rectangle in front, an equally sized rectangle in back, two rectangles for the sleeves with square gussets in the underarm, and then triangular gores. They're made out of two triangles put together to make one bigger triangle, and those go on each side to make it flare out at the hips. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, this didn't come with any instructions, it just came with measurements for how to get the different pieces, and then I figured out how to place them all together. But I found that with the original measurements, the back was really, really low, lower than I wanted it to be, so I pieced in a square here, 
make it come up about to the same spot on my neckline as the kirtle. And then when I tried it on, I found that it was way too wide at the top, so I took it in a little bit on each side. I wanted to make sure it was about the same size at the waist, but I did see in some other shift patterns that the width at the shoulders was a little bit smaller. So I did that until it fit about right, and I will cut those off in a little bit. I'm afraid to right now, so we're still on. So I decided to not take any fullness out of the front because it is the same dimensions as the back, but I added a little piece along here and along the shoulders to run a cord through, and also in the front it gives me a little extra coverage. It did come down a tiny bit too low. I probably should have lengthened my measurements a bit. Um, so I plan on running like a little drawstring for the neckline through all of these bias binding pieces that I put on here. I sewed them along the edge, then flipped them in and whipped them, as one is wont to do. And I didn't plan it in advance at all, so it's not continuous, which I would not recommend. So I'm figuring, though, that I can probably use my tapestry needle to thread my drawstring through all of that and just make it work after the fact. I'm gonna Tim gun this because I can't be bothered. I'm having a moment and I need to be talked off the ledge because I hate everything about this shift. I feel like the neckline's wrong. I feel like the material's wrong. I feel like it's all just wrong. I already had to patch in a whole thing back here. And all of this is very thick. I wanted this just to be a tiny, elegant rolled hem, but instead it's a big old, chunky, essentially bias binding. And it's too low. Maybe I'm in a grumpy mood and I just need to eat a Snickers, but I'm so frustrated. I've been working on this for days and I think the whole thing's wrong. It should be an easy garment, but it's proving to be harder to make than the entire dress. I don't hate it as much on, but I still hate it, you know? After grabbing a metaphorical Snickers, I decided to just get on with it by doing a rolled hem at the bottom of the shift. My biggest issue was the really rough texture of the fabric, so I fixed that by making some homemade fabric softener out of conditioner, apple cider vinegar, and hot water. After soaking that and then rinsing it out, the fabric was a lot softer and more enjoyable to wear. I finished the shift by sewing the cuffs to the outside using a straight stitch, then folding them in and whipping the inside down. I also flat felled all of the interior seams to finish them off. Then I delved into making the French hood using the Tudor Taylor pattern and relying once again on Yuldy projector to get the pieces cut out. And if you're going to use the projector, learn from my mistakes and really be careful double checking the scale before you cut everything out. It consists of three main pieces, the brim that goes around your head, the crescent that sits on top of that, and the veil that covers your hair. For the base layer, which should be made out of buckram, you'll leave no seam allowance except for on the very ends of the center back where you should add on a half inch of seam allowance. You'll then sew wire around the edges to allow for shaping. I'm sewing on the wire to the crescent. The wire is going to go around the outside edge and I'm over casting over it so there's a little bar in here and I'm butting the wire up on the inside of the bar so that the thread will go over it and encase it to this edge here. You could also do this by hand but I'm trying to be quick about it. Honestly, I didn't find that using the machine made this much faster than doing it by hand, but it was more dangerous. I was a little worried the wire wasn't going to be stiff enough, and it might be a little bit weak, but I think it'll be enough to do the job admirably. It won't set the Thames on fire. Little hoodling. Now I've just got to do the other one, which will be more complicated because it has a lot more shapes to it. Based on the very glancing research that I have done online, it seems like there is some question as to whether hoods were flat or arched like this as they are seen often on film and in reenactments, which that's an interesting debate, but um, I want to look like a fancy person in a movie, so we're going with the, uh, the Tudor Taylor's recommendation for something that does have a bit of an arch to it and isn't flat, although I don't have the batting, very thin batting to go over this, so I will have to figure out a solution. I didn't have buckram either, but came up with the next best thing, my fake canvas material that I use for everything. So the instructions say to take the seam allowance of this part, which is the bit that's going to go behind your head, and sew along the seam allowance to connect it. This goes over your head, should end there, and then this will connect behind the head. And I'm going to sew it first, and then probably regret my decisions. It doesn't necessarily need to be sewn like this, but since this fabric isn't prone to fraying, I'm gonna do it that way to try and reduce bulk. That seems right. I look like a fancy Tudor lady. Huzzah! I just looped that around, and now I'm going to press it down to try and make this as safe as possible, so hopefully it will not poke me in the future. I am just winging this, so I do hope to the powers that be 
It is correct. It's looking right. I feel like that's my journey with every sewing project. It's like, I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly. It usually looks like a hot, hot mess until the very last moment, and it's like, oh, it's starting to come together. It's looking like a thing. Of course, when you make your own stuff, you know, like, intimately every flaw with it. <laughs> Which sometimes makes it better, sometimes makes it worse, depending on whether or not you can fix the flaw or find a good enough solution to make do. I have stitched the wire, now we have the base of both, and now I need to figure out how to drape them in something to make them mildly poofy. Then I figure I will cover them in this beautiful thrift store sort of sateen. So the Tudor tailor says to cover these pieces with domet, which is kind of a interlining layer, a little bit like batting, but very thin. You're supposed to basically cut out the pattern pieces again, but with a half inch of seam allowance all around because you're going to be whipping it to the other side. So there needs to be enough to fold over the edges. I was loath to use the interlining that I had because I wanted to save it for more everyday projects. So instead, I just lined this with a bit of muslin. Then I whipped the muslin on, clipping the curves to make sure that it fits snugly around. Unfortunately, I kept forgetting to add in the seam allowance at the back, so there was a bit of a gap. Then I cut the same pieces out of my fashion fabric, but this time I measured a half inch seam allowance around the entire thing so that it could be whipped down to the base. Oh wow, that's pretty good. Working on the decoration for the bilament, it's a combination of thrift store faux pearls and then these stones that are from Joann's. My mom got them for a project and then isn't going to use them, and since the, the overdress is going to be green, this will be a nice complement. Doing it on a little bit of jewelry wire, bend that to keep these on. I've done some smaller beads at the end, and then worked up to larger ones. The next step is I will be sewing the crescent to this part. It's supposed to be set back 18 centimeters and then sewn on. The bilament will kind of cover where these two are connected. It fits pretty well. It's supposed to terminate around the cheekbones. I also have the sateen ribbon. I'm gonna pleat it and that's supposed to kind of stick out of the front edge. I am dyeing my bed sheet curdle fabric, which is kind of dark purple. I'm trying to dye that black for the veil because traditionally the veils are made out of black velvet. If I can't get it to dye dark enough, then I am gonna cannibalize this shirt, but it's a nice shirt, so I'm hoping that doesn't have to happen. And I just crimp the ends and I plan to kind of whip around all of the wire to sew it on there. I pinned the crescent 18 millimeters back and then I whipped it on, with some help, of course. I dyed the fabric. It does have a bit of like a purple red cast to it still. It's close enough to black, so we're gonna go with that. And I started stitching the front bit on. It's still loose over here. It's probably on the whole a little bit bigger than would be historically accurate. Whatever, it's green, it goes with it, it looks good. I'm sorry people on Instagram who voted for smaller pearls. There are some here on the edge, but I had already started making this by the time I looked at the pole. Then I whip the bilament onto the brim and the crescent. I sew the edges of the veil together and hem the top and the bottom before attaching it to the crescent. I started with whip stitches but found that left too much of a gap so I switched to ladder stitches and I think that worked much better. Then I started on a pleated ribbon decoration for the front of the brim. I used inch wide dollar store sateen ribbon but the instructions in the Tudor tailor call for a metallic organza that's about an inch wide when folded in half and pressed. I started by running two parallel running stitches, each stitch nine millimeters apart, that can then be drawn together to make equidistant pleats. It says to steam these to set them. I skipped that step and it worked well enough for me. Gather the pleats together and then distribute them evenly along the brim, pinning them in place. Then whip the bottom of each of them to the inside. With the French head done, it was time to put the entire ensemble together. I'm not gonna lie to you, though I'm really pleased with how both of these projects turned out. They almost destroyed me during the process. I nearly didn't finish the shift because I was so frustrated that it wasn't perfect, it wasn't how I imagined it in my mind, it wasn't historically accurate enough, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. But then I stopped, regathered my thoughts, and realized that it's so much better to have something that's imperfect than to be perfect at nothing. So if you're struggling with getting started, just do it. Just go for it because you'll be so much happier to have something imperfect that you've always wanted than to wonder what if. So, if my weird bedsheet clothing can teach you anything, let's just give it a try. What do you have to lose? Because you certainly have a whole lot to gain. Because even though this is a few yards of thrift store curtains, old bedsheets, and muslin from Joann's, 
What it really represents is a whole lot of learning of taking something that was just a concept, a pretty scary concept to be honest, and turning it into something tangible, something you can touch and wear and stare at yourself in the mirror in because you finally have an outfit that will turn heads at the Renaissance Fair like you've always dreamed. So whatever project you've been holding in your heart and in your head, please go for it and let me know what you've made. Thanks for watching! If you liked this video, give it a like and subscribe because there will be more Tudor outfit making coming soon. And if you're fond of the Tudor era, check out my Shakespeare themed coloring book, Color the Bard. I'll link it down below. Thanks so much for watching, and in the meantime, keep making.